seminar number four, uh, Texas City and Process Tracing. And the papers are um, uh, Lisanne Bainbridge's um, paper on verbal uh, reports, Woods on Process Tracing, and uh, 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 Erickson and Simon on verbal reports. Um, Let's begin with text. Let's begin as we always do with questions from the past episodes. You've had a chance now to think about some of these things and consider them in your full in the fullness of time. And you have, if if there's any points that are that need clarification, we should bring them up now. Otherwise, I can assume that you've understood everything that went before. <laughs> I always ask. Yeah. No, there are a lot of questions. Okay, yeah. go ahead. No, Go ahead. Well, I, I wasn't here on the last seminar, so okay. uh, uh, That's not a question, though. No, yeah. no, and I think that I'm going to refrain from asking the questions. Oh, come on, ask the question. The movie. No, I, I was just interested in, in um, uh, the, I mean, the concept of, of, of artifacts. Yes. As a way into producing, and, and uh, in, I mean, I've, I've read some of the papers that that, that you have written. Uh, but I was co I was interested in knowing uh, which examples do you have uh, of that technique being used in healthcare? Yes. What types of situations have been studied successfully? And, 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 uh, the and the most obvious one of these is Chris Namath's uh, PhD dissertation, mm -hmm. which is a study of a variety of cognitive artifacts that all swirl around the development of the operating room schedule, which is presented, was presented as a series of pieces of paper that were put on a board and yeah. were managed now as an electronic artifact, mm -hmm. but had associated with it a whole bunch of other artifacts like availability schedules, listing all the people who could work there and you know various other kinds of things. And so he was able to decipher the the system by, by essentially taking and tracing the artifacts in their use and then watching, actually setting up some experiments using the artifacts. Um, and, and we'll try and fold a little of that into the discussion today because it goes into this business about um, uh, process tracing and how you set that up and what Woods was talking about in the latter portion of his, uh, his articles. Other questions? Okay. Uh, Texas City. Um, Texas City is in Texas. It's a town that is basically an industrial sort of town, and and, uh, and, and there's a lot of chemical processing and, and particularly petroleum processing, as you know, in Texas. And uh, the plant in which uh, this uh, process was going on um, was working with a, a, a material called raffinate. which is a petroleum byproduct that is used as part of compounding for making gasoline. So gasoline's a whole bunch of different things. And raffinate is one of the things that gets processed further and turned into things that go into gasoline. So it's part of the gasoline making process. And like other, other petroleums, um, the, the big issue here is that um, uh, it's got a boiling point uh, and a vapor pressure, um, and it's also uh, flammable in the right kinds of settings. And the process that goes on is basically putting it into a variety of different kinds of, pro of, of uh, chemical processing that ends up refining this and producing what you want based upon its physical properties, like when it boils and how much vapor pressure there is and so forth. This was one, the, the, the accident happened as one of many processes taking part in a big petroleum plant. So there's lots and lots of stuff that goes on in a big uh, uh, petroleum processing plant. Many different processes going on, many different areas. And in fact, these are large work settings where there's always work going on, both production work, repair work, new building, uh, modifications, and so forth that, that, that are all happening simultaneously inside the, the factory or inside the plant. Um, and, and it never stops. There's always maintenance going on. There's always new construction going on. There's always modifications going on because that's the nature of this sort of business. 
Uh, this plant had been in operation since the 1950s, and so there's lots of old equipment around. There's also lots of new equipment around. It had been upgraded uh, in a variety of ways, and things had been put in. And one of the most important parts of this was that it had a uh, 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 sort of a uh, computer-based uh, control room. Uh, and so this begins to look a little bit more like our experience in Three Mile Island and some of the other settings because although this is spread out and, and really quite variable in the sense that a nuclear plant is not, things are going on, there are people working and changing stuff, um, the actual operations for any kind of production run are handled from a central location with lots of displays around and lots of controls around and operators who sit there and who are doing things that have effects remotely at different places. And it, the, the, um, the computer-based control room component of this is important because um, much of the sensing uh, and control, uh, sensing and acting, are mediated through computers. I mean, the big thing is that rather than me controlling things by opening a valve or throwing a switch, um, what I'm doing is I'm using computers uh, and, and keyboards to control what are little diagrams of the plant and various components and devices and so forth. They're all drawn together with all sorts of information displayed, and I'm interacting with that basically through the computer. Okay? So it begins to look a little bit, it, it's actually more advanced than Three Mile Island in some ways because in Three Mile Island there were still individual components controlled by switches, this is a world in which the components are controlled mostly by computers. And you interact with them by a keyboard or a mouse or something like that. Um, the event that occurred involved um, a tank that was a processing tank that, that was used to heat up um, uh, raffinate. Uh, and it had a, uh, an input port and it also had um, an output port. Um, and the output port was supposed to be open, but in fact was chained to closed. The, the device, this, this, this uh, device actually has a, it's a closed sort of tank because you want to keep the vapors inside. So it has a thing that goes over to a Another tank, which is essentially an overflow tank, and the overflow tank has itself a tower on it that goes down into the tank like this, so that uh, this, and this is open to air. Um, what happened was that the operator through this control room turned on a pump that pushed raffinate into this thing. There was a heating process going on here as well. And the raffinate rose in, in this, and there's supposed to be a certain amount of raffinate in it to begin this process, but it's not anywhere near full. It's, you know, like 10% full or less than that. And there are sensors in here that are designed to tell you if you are uh, have reached the appropriate level of raffinate. There's a sensor in here that goes back to the control room that says, okay, you've reached this level. There's also a sensor in here, which is sort of a high-level sensor, which goes back here, which is supposed to be an alarm. Uh, and this sensor did not, for, for reasons which are unclear, was out of maintenance and therefore not working. So they didn't have their high-level alarm in one fashion or another. And the worker started this process up of pumping things into the tank and basically forgot or stopped paying attention to that because he was paying attention to other things or it was unclear exactly how this happened. And the tank continued to fill. And it filled not only past the normal level and past the alarm level, but it filled up completely and then started going over into this overflow tank. And the overflow tank itself um, there's, there's actually a, uh, safety valves in here which are supposed to keep the 
there's a safety valve in here which is supposed to keep this from happening beyond a certain pressure, but once the pressure reaches an opening, a, a certain level, the safety valve opens to allow this stuff to drain into the overflow tank. The overflow tank became full. It filled up because this was all now full of raffinate, and it actually pushed the raffinate all the way up and out the top of the tower pipe. Not, not the, there was not an open, this was full of liquid. Okay, so it's full of the liquid and it actually pours out of this and falls down because it's heavier. It doesn't immediately vaporize, it falls down and as it falls down and through the air, it vaporizes, it, it uh, goes into a gas phase. And so what you end up with is this big cloud of gas that surrounds this whole area. There's a, uh, a truck standing nearby with the motor running. And it's a diesel motor, and what happens is the truck begins to run rough. It has a, somebody notices that the engine is not running right, it's choking, da, 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 and it backfires. It's choking because instead of bringing in air to mix with the diesel fuel, it's bringing in this gas that is loaded with all this petroleum. You know, this, it backfires, and the backfire ignites this cloud and turns it into a large bomb. And the bomb basically destroys the entire area, Bas blows the whole place up, just simply, um, it's, it's a, like a huge explosive device going off. In fact, we now know that one of the ways that you can create devastating uh, explosions without using nuclear weapons is to, call, is to use what's called an air fuel explosive, which is where you take a lot of fuel and you vaporize it and then you set that off as a gas uh, and it creates this huge explosion. And this is one of the things that people have been talking about recently in the Mideast. Uh, this was an air fuel explosive on a, on a grand scale. And so the, the shockwave from this went out in a bunch of different directions and basically destroyed the surrounding area. Unfortunately, near this truck were a whole bunch of construction trailers that were basically brought in to um, serve as housing for people working on this project. Not housing, but, but to serve as offices and, and work uh, s sections for people who were working on maintenance in this area. These were not supposed to be here. There's, a, there's specific rules in the operation that says you can't have anything around this. You don't want to have people around this because if you have an explosion or some fire or some problem, you don't want a lot of people injured. And, but in fact, by the time, at the time that this happened, there were lots and lots of people living or working in this area uh, who were workers, and as a consequence, 15 workers were killed. Um, they were basically people who were sitting in these um, trailers, and the trailers were simply blown away. They were destroyed by the, by the blast, completely destroyed. There was nothing recognizable left. Um, it took a long time to put the fire out because the, this explosion generated a lot of other fires. It was a very big thing. It, it shook the surrounding neighborhood. It was a, a huge environmental issue. There were big clouds and stuff. And so it became, it, it, was, it was far too big an accident to uh, sort of treat as normal. The other thing that's interesting about this is unlike other BP-related accidents, for example, the uh, Deepwater Horizon spill, this happens in an area in which people live. This is in the middle of a city. This is not some you know, far remote place where when it blows up, the only people who are affected are the workers and the folks who are associated with that. This is actually happening inside a city, and there are lots of pictures of, of this plant burning taken from people's backyards because it's that close. What, what was interesting as well around this time is that, that on a, on a that when, when this, the chemical accident, the chemical uh, safety board <coughs> looked at this, they looked at it in depth, and they found a, a bunch of BP organizational change There were a whole series of reorganizations of this facility over the past few years that had basically disrupted the understandings of what, who was responsible for safety and what was that responsibility. And instead of safety being some sort of 
function here, it became abstracted away into the organization somewhere. And it didn't, uh, a lot of these conditions, this, this uh, chained closed um, uh, outlet here, the failure of the sensors, problems with the operators and so on, all at, at, at later on seemed to be um, somehow brought on by the, the rapid rate of organizational change and that safety had somehow lo been lost in the process. Um, that it was clear that there were a whole bunch of production pressures. Um, that is, people are supposed to be working on getting more product made in the refinery rather than pursuing safety that, that led to this. And, and there was a host of, of sort of the, the usual sort of uh, latent failures that we've seen before uh, that are related to um, poor design of uh, the displays and uh, the controls in the control room, um, the maintenance on the, uh, uh, on the sensors and the other operations out here, and, 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 and also just the sort of understanding by operators of what was going on. And looking back at this afterwards, they found that the process, uh, uh, let me make one other observation about this that I think is important, which is that, that this occurred during startup. That is, once these processes get going, they work in a way that's different than starting them up. So starting up the process requires a different set of activities than running it continuously. Once you have it running continuously, you can be pouring stuff in one end and getting it out the other, and everything runs sort of smoothly in between. But startup doesn't, doesn't have things in it, so you have to sort of prime all the pumps by doing a different set of operations. And it, it, it's clear that the startup proceed, although the running operations had a pretty good representation here in the control room, that the startup didn't. And the startup became a real problem because it, it was done very informally. Uh, the, the, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is clear is that the way in which you started this plant was not well specified. So if you look at the logs that people are making about what's going on here, in starting this up, they'll say, you know, the log will say, uh, uh, put some RAF in uh, in the name of the tank. Not how much or how long it took or what the amounts are supposed to be or how that's measured or any of that sort of stuff. It's a very offhand sort of thing because startup and, and shut down turn out to be hard things to specify in a lot of these chemical processing things that are designed for continuous production. Um, all of the indicators about the quality and safety of this plant prior to the accident were essentially positive. That is, all of the signs and sim signals that the organization was collecting um, about safety, all of the safety information that seemed to be flowing here was essentially positive. That is, we have safety, we're doing the right sorts of things, we're managing the system very well. Uh, it was nobody was saying, "Hey, you've got this serious problem here." Um, it's hard to know if specifically identifying at one of these latent failures would have called any attention to it. As you know, you can identify latent failures all day, and you don't necessarily consider that to be an emergency. But but it's clear that this whole process of of how the plant worked. Had gone in, had had become itself inherently unsafe and and dangerous in a variety of ways. Most notably, that nobody was paying any attention to the work rules about having people not cite um, construction uh, offices near this stuff and so forth. That that somehow this system had slipped into a kind of unsafe operation where this was going to happen. And um, very disturbingly, it seemed to be um, that no one was sort of minding the store. Everybody was concerned about production. Everybody understood that production was the name of the game. And everybody kind of thought safety was either built into the processes or somehow somebody was looking out for it. But it turned out that no one was. 
the repeat of these kinds of circumstances in the Deepwater Horizon experience is very chilling. For those who study this sort of thing, you find out that, you know, 10 or 12 years later, uh, you have the same kinds of circumstances being recreated, the same kinds of issues. Again, Deepwater Horizon was very safe in, term, in, 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 in formal terms at the same time that it was reaching this extraordinarily dangerous circumstance. There was stuff going on that was clearly uh, not appropriate. They knew that the well was going to have, was having some difficulty because the process of sealing it was, was quite abnormal. Nobody put all that together. There were lots of controls and displays that were going off and lots of alarms that were present, but the alarms were mostly turned off because they just went off all the time. And so you ended up with a situation where um, afterwards you can see all the flaws, but prospectively looking forward, nobody is able to understand that they're running into this risk of failure. So let's move on and talk a little bit about this business of verbal protocols and how we, how we look for data in the world and why that is sometimes difficult and why we sometimes find ourselves not having a great deal of success or trying to understand things that are quite difficult to understand. The first paper by Lisanne Bainbridge is interesting in part because Lisanne is a very experienced researcher from the UK. Uh, she's still doing some work, um, who knows all the heavies. So you see in here references to people like Broadbent and Rasmussen and all the rest of that. She's their contemporary and therefore is interacting directly with the people who we think of as the founders. And People are trying, they're struggling at this time to try and find ways to help operators. This is the late 70s and everybody understands that the problem that you have is you have an operator who has, who has some sort of view of a task. In this case, we'll put it on the computer screen. And who therefore has to be able to form some sort of mental model of what the task is. And in that, in that uh, operation, we're, we're trying to figure out what's going on here so that we can build better representations to make this task more accurate, this process of building the mental model more accurate. It's a very pragmatic issue. It's not highly theoretical. Nobody's talking about mind-body dualism or Descartes or any of that sort of stuff. It's not that kind of world. It's a very practical, what we would say, pragmatic situation, which is we want to make these things better so this performs better so that the processes in the world have better performance and that we don't get accidents out of them, right? I mean, that's the basic idea. It's not a very, I mean, it's not, it's not a, in any way a, a sort of a sophisticated thinking. And, and the processes that they're concerned about are air traffic control, uh, cockpit, uh, cockpits uh, of various sorts, mostly in, in, in commercial aviation, and nuclear power plants, of course. And, and so they're, they're concerned about the same things that everybody has been concerned about all along. They're looking at the same kind of stuff. And one of the things that people are doing a lot is they're interviewing these operators. And they're saying to the operators, well, what goes on? What are, you, what are you looking at when you're trying to control this plant? When you're, when you're, you know, turning the big knob, when you turn the big knob, what is it that you're trying to do? And we know that they turn the big knob, and we know that they turn the big knob in these kind of funny ways, and people are trying to figure out how do we understand what they understand the big knob does That if I'm turning the big knob, I'm having this effect. We're, we're trying to figure this sort of stuff out. And so there's been there's there's a lot of there's a lot of interviewing. There's a lot of questionnaires. Um, 
various kinds of questionnaires, verbal questions, written questions. And, and be, this is the, the late 70s, early 80s. There's a lot of sort of simulation. And the simulation is either very simple in the sense that it's like a tabletop simulation where you draw things out and ask people to point to them. Or they're quasi-static simulations where you do stuff. There's, there are simulators around, but they're not, they're not the full mission simulators that we now think of because those things are developed a little bit later. There, you, there's some access to them, but not a lot. And so the question that uh, Lisanne is trying to ask and answer is, how well do these things represent what's going on up here? How, how, how well do we get, how, how, what's the relationship between this and this? Is, this? is this good? It's telling us what's going on? Uh, is it bad? How does it work? And so forth. And she's really looking at that sort of question. And the observation that she makes, which is, a, which is a, I think, a, a, an important one, is that if you watch operators do this stuff, most of the time they can do their work without speaking. They don't have to talk to do the work. They can, they're operating the plant, and they're not actually talking about that. They're not saying, I'm turning on this switch, I'm turning off this. They're simply doing it. So, so this process that they're engaged in is, is, is really not verbal during the time that they're doing it. They're not saying this. And then what we very often do is ask them to come along and do something verbal. We ask them to say some words about this. And her question is, how do these words relate to what's actually happening in the head? Well, what can we say about this? And, and the claim that she makes is a pretty simple one, which she says, she says, if we're thinking about the, the operator and what's happening in their head. There are some mental processes and there are some verbal processes. And these are two different things. Okay, the verbal stuff is different than the mental stuff. They belong in different categories. They, she says basically you cannot go from one to the other that the process that people are using to generate the work is a different process than what people are using to generate the words. And that these two are, are, are not the same. And, and in fact, that there's a kind of real strong barrier between these two, which is that when you, you cannot, in, in essence, have access or you do not have access to your own mental processing, that the fact that the mental processing is happening in your head does not mean that you, as a person, have privileged access to your mental processing. There's a kind of wall that exists there, a barrier between those two. And that, that means that what we get out in, when we look at most verbalizations, what's coming out is, in fact, something that reflects a sort of other process, which, which we would call the process of introspection. And by this, we mean the process where you look into your head, and I say to you, what are you thinking about right now? And you, you say, I'm thinking about blah, blah, blah. Introspection is this process of trying to look in and see what's going on. Um, it's, it's clear that this is a problem, and it's really difficult because, in fact, what we get out of introspection, in most cases, is not these mental processes that are working in here, but rationalization. that what comes out of this is, in fact, rationalization and not anything else. That it, and, and, and we don't have a lot of trouble with understanding this because we come from the healthcare world. And one of the things that healthcare people are good at is rationalizing. We are very verbal people. We have large vocabularies. We use words a lot. And so if somebody says to us, why did you start that IV? We can generate lots of explanations for that that are perfectly reasonable. I started the IV because the patient needs some fluid, and the patient needs some fluid because he's hypovolemic, and we could have him 
take the fluid in by mouth, but if he took it in by mouth, since he's vomiting and that's the reason he's hypovolemic, it's not going to stay in. So we put the IV in and we'll increase his circulating volume by getting him some fluid and he will feel better. Okay? That's the rationalization process. It's giving, rationalization is essentially giving reasons for or explaining why. And, and um, she goes on to point out that, that in fact, many of the times what we think of as our memories are not memories at all in the conventional sense of memory being some stored collection of, of how things work. We're not actually interrogating, in introspection, we're not actually interrogating our memory. We're not doing this. I'm sorry, I've, got, I've drawn this wrong. We're not interrogating our memory to produce the words. What we are doing is, in fact, interrogating our memory to create a rationalization which we then give voice to. That is, if you say, tell me how this happened, what you do is you work out an explanation of how it must have happened, and you give that as it, rather than drawing on exact memory traces that are in your brain from that event. The episode that happened is not an episode that's encoded directly, and so you are not reporting directly what's coming from that episode, but rather you are working out the details of how that must have occurred. You understand this distinction? It's a pretty important one because it's clear that, the, that if you think about an episode as something that's stored in memory, an episode might be a little story or something, a little bit, little picture that you have. Imagine something that's coming out of a dream when you wake up and you have a dream and you have a very clear recollection. I was standing there naked in front of the classroom. You know, that's the kind of dreams that we have, right? Or, or I, I was realized I was giving my talk and I was not prepared to speak, you know, and I was standing at the podium and feeling real. But, but we have a picture, and we, when we interrogate memory, we can get a hold of that picture and describe it. But in fact, if people ask us for, for this stuff, it turns out that these traces are, are often not nearly as complete as we think that they are, and so we fill in much of the detail in the process of explaining what's going on. And that filling in happens because of our ability to, our, our knowledge of the world. That is, our memory also contains uh, knowledge of the world. And we use this knowledge to explain what has happened to us. And so if you ask people how they do things, they will tell you what makes sense based upon their knowledge of the world, but that may be quite a long distance away from the actual processes that are involved in their work. A good example of this is found in one of the old papers in which um, pilot trainers are asked to explain what they train people to do in emergencies, students, people learning how to fly, and they say, oh, in an emergency, I tell people that I want you to look first at this instrument and then set, first at this instrument and then at this instrument and then at this instrument. Okay, you do this in this order, you do these. Okay, one, two, three, four. This is what you do, this is what, I, what we teach people, this is what we do. And they took these same people, these same pilot trainers and they put them in a simulator and they gave them the simulated events and they didn't do anything like that. In fact, they did something quite different. Meaning that their understanding of what they did in the emergency, which was generated from knowledge of the world, was not the same thing as their performance. The performance and the, and the knowledge of things may be quite different. And that's very true in healthcare. We are, we are, one of the first things that we do in learning how to be healthcare people is to give reasons for. And so if someone says, why did you do that? We will answer with reasons for, not what the prompts and, and, and cues were in the world that made us pick up the syringe and choose that syringe. This is so much part of our world that in fact, it ends up feeling as though it's all that exists. That is, we really, if we're being more accurate, we would draw this as being kind of a blank space. This is, this is the blank space that you can't get into because nobody can get in there. You can't have access to it. You can't see it directly. And that is essentially what, what Bainbridge is saying. She's saying, look, there's a whole bunch of mental processes that go on that you can't get access to. And, and we are taking, in our work here, 
we are taking the words that get generated out of this process as being indicative of this mental stuff, and it's not. It just isn't. It's just not there. That's the basic theme of what she's saying. And, and indeed, um, we'll talk about Erickson a little bit later, but, but, but Erickson's uh, paper tells you that this is actually true. But Erickson says that it's a good thing. I mean, what's different about Erickson and Simon is not that they disagree with Bainbridge. They, act they actually agree. They talk about there are some tasks that you can do where you can verbalize it directly. And they talk about, you know, you're, saying, you're talking about what you're doing. And, and there, there are utterances. That means sounds coming out of the person. We won't even say that they're words. They're just sounds coming out of people. And these sounds can be generated without interfering with this process too much. And they talk about the think out loud protocols that they have used and the various studies that they've done. And it's clear that there are some kinds of mental processes where you can get people to talk out loud and the, and the words and stuff that you hear them say are in some way related to what's happening up here. It's a complex situation, but this is not a separate place. I mean, there's not, there's not the processing brain and the word generating brain. There's one brain. They're connect it's all connected together. By the way, one of the reasons we know it's all connected together is if you look at people who have had various kinds of brain injuries, like various kinds of strokes, you can see what happens when it's not connected. And when people have that difficulty, for instance, with word finding or with, with, with fluent speech and so on. They also point out that, that um, you can have other kinds of things where you, where you have now a process that refers, that where you're actually thinking about something that you're thinking about, and that this can influence the utterances in a different way. So you can end up with a secondary thing. You can end up with these utterances coming out of some thinking about some thinking. And it becomes a bit more complicated that way because what you're really saying is I'm having these thoughts and I'm processing them and then I'm telling you about the processing that I've had on those thoughts. Mm. But they actually, they actually think that this is good because they think that this actually has a, has a positive effect that, that the process of thinking about what I'm thinking about and verbalization helps because it actually feeds back to this process and makes it better. And their claim is that the experiments that they do show that talking out loud makes people's performance on the primary task actually better. That, that by doing this, there's some pro you, you're getting access to this. You're doing something up here that makes this function better. I mean, that's the claim that they make. And, and it's a very interesting one because if you're saying, if, you, if you're talking about this, this, this must be what we call education. And that's what they are studying. So Erickson and Simon are studying education. They're education theorists, and they're trying to understand education. And what they say makes perfect sense. That is, when you talk out loud, you are expressing thoughts in a particular way, and that that process helps you learn about those things and improve on them. And we use this all the time, right? This is a basic principle of education. So it's not surprising that people can find this in the laboratory. So we know, that, we know that there's this problem with the difference between thoughts and words. <clears throat> I want to just <clears throat> at least nod in the direction of Descartes, though, and say that, that what we are really talking about here is some sort of mind-body dualism. This comes up again and again. That is. I have my mind, which is the place where the thinking is going on that I don't really have access to. And then I have these verbalizations, which are made by my body, which you can obtain and hear and record and so forth. And there's a split between the two, right? This is a line. And this is sort of saying the words and this sort of stuff is over on some sort of body level. We're saying it, and therefore it comes out of the body. And then there's this mind thing, which is separate, which, is, which we don't have access to and which we're trying to deal with. And the real us is somehow in here. And this is just the body stuff. We'll re everybody who tries to deal with this comes up against this mind-body dualism problem again and again. And, and it's a really serious problem because almost all of the models that people make about how cognitive functioning works ends up producing something like this at some place. And sometimes what they do is they just 
move it a step away. They they can they move they they divide the brain up into the body part and the brain and the mind part, and they talk about these things in ways that are really just it's just removing it one step and pretending that we don't have that problem. What neither Bainbridge nor Erickson and Simon would disagree with, though, is that this stuff means something. That is, when the, you grab a hold of the big knob and you turn it, you are doing something in the world, and you're doing it for a purpose that may be a good purpose or a bad purpose. You may be informed or misinformed. You know, a three-year-old can grab the big knob and turn it, and will. Okay, so it's clear that just turning the knob is not the important thing. It has to be something up here that drives this process of turning the knob. Everyone agrees with that. No one disputes that. No one disputes that the people are thinking about some sort of model of things and that they understand that they're influencing the world. No one is disputing that. What they're disputing is that the words that people say can be used to directly reflect what's going on in this. Okay, so there's no, there's no. There's no fundamental theoretical disagreement about the fact that people are doing things in the world or that they are using their minds to do them or that the, the processing in the mind is complicated in various ways or even that, the, that there are models in the mind, mental models and things like that. There's no, no one is, is trying to dispute that. And in fact, it's kind of funny because in Bainbridge's world, since this is so empty, you can, you can pose almost any idea you want to, for what goes in there. Right? He just says you can't get a hold of it. And so you say, okay, well, I, then I will say it is like this. And what she would say is you can't use verbalizations, verbal, verbal reports, to, a, a, to evaluate this directly because it's not accessible. Okay? That's, the, that's our fundamental problem. We know that what's going on in here is important. We understand that it's critical to operating our world and our systems, but we somehow can't get at it. And, and so we, we are in this position of being sort of blinded. We are looking at the world through all this stuff, and we're somehow hoping that we do something. And, and one of the ways that you could do this is you could just try, you can do experiments. You can try a hundred different displays. You'd go into the simulator. You can try a hundred different displays with a hundred different, with the same problem over and over. Each display being slight, slightly different, and you can see which produces the best performance. Right? You could do that experiment. You can imagine, or at least you could imagine doing the experiment. You could imagine going in and saying, "I'm going to, I'm going to take this display. I'm going to change it this way, and I'm going to test the two and see if they're different. And then I'm going to test that one against this one, and I could end up building this big testing thing." And so long as my operator performance stayed relatively the same and I gave them the same problems and stuff, I could make arguments that one display was better than another. And eventually I might decide that, you know, three is really the, is the good display and that's what we're going to put in the control room and therefore everybody's happy. I mean, you could do that. The problem is that the complexity that we have in the world quickly outruns our ability to create all these things. You can't see, you have to, at some level, you have to have some idea about what it is that people are doing because to create these candidate displays requires that you have an idea about what is going on. So the interesting thing is that as researchers, we often pretend as though we don't exist in this picture anywhere, but in fact, we do. We are researchers ourselves And we are watching all of this and building our own models of what this guy is doing, right? I mean, we, we leave ourselves out of the picture because we would like to pretend that we don't exist here. But, but we're really part of this, and we're doing modeling and all this sort of stuff, and watching and making assessments and validating and so on. We're not really separate from this. We're part of this. And so much of what we do in terms of making up these displays, we think, OK, I'm going to make up a set of displays. 
is based upon what we think is actually going on in there, right? There's, you can't get around this. So eventually we have to look inside. We have to do something to get inside this space. And the question is, can we get inside it and can we do it in a way that, that has some kind of validity? Now, I don't mean validity in the narrow scientific sense of testing to see whether or not the Higgs boson is real or not. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of pragmatic reality, which is can we do enough of this that we might be able to somehow explain or, ex or, or improve the performance that we're seeing? And the answer that Woods gives us is yes. Woods says there is a way to do this, and he sort of lays out a process for this. And, and this is the process that he describes as process tracing. He calls it process tracing, but he also calls it protocol analysis. Protocol analysis has become problematic because Erickson and Simon have done a lot of protocol analysis and they do it in a kind of laboratory setting in which it's very, everything is nicely controlled and so forth. And they're trying to make, ask questions about what's really going on in here. Woods is trying to, is using process tracing to indicate a much bigger span, a much bigger scope of which some of these little protocols might be part. But the process that he's talking about tracing is the process of cognition applied to the world and specifically to some process or problems that exist in the world. And he's using features of the world that make it nice and allow him to build these process, these process traces. Okay, and he tells us something about how to do this and, and, and what, the, what the approaches would be. But here's the big thing that, that matters. And everybody agrees on this again, this is both um, Lasan and Erickson and Simon and Woods all agree that the whole key is to be able to get externalizations. That is, actions in the world, whether they be words or controlling the big knob or whatever, to get externalizations over time. That is, they want, you want to see not one externalization. It's not a one-shot thing. You don't check to see whether or not somebody can discriminate between this and that, but rather look at a problem over time and watch how people work on that problem over time. And by watching their actions and listening to their verbalizations to understand what it is that's going on in, going on in here. Now, one of the things that's nice about the world's the process control world is is this control idea. And that is that operators exist to control the process. So if they are doing nothing except monitoring it, if they're sitting just watching, there's no externalization there, you can't tell what they're doing. But if they're engaging in some control, they're turning on switches, turning off lights, and so on and so forth. They're doing things. These are externalizations. They're doing it because they are trying to control the world. And so you, one of the things that makes this externalization work is if you live in a world in which there's lots of control activities. And <clears throat> interestingly enough, um, this turns out to fit all of the areas that we are interested in. And Woods lists some, but he talks about air traffic control, cockpits, nuclear power plants, and the operating room, the surgical operating room. He says, look, these are all places where people are doing some sort of process and controlling some sort of process. And they are doing lots of, there's lots of little bits of activity. Ne they never stop, really. And so we have a trace that goes over time of things that are happening. They're not, this, is, this isn't a, they do lots of different things. And they do these different things in a particular order. And we can record these things. And if we can also record something about the world and the way it looks at each time, suppose that we make a film of the world that's going along, then we can have some idea about how these things are related. That is, if we can, can, can re 
control the, if we can record what the stimuli are in the world, the cues to which people are attending, what's happening out there, and capture the important stuff, and then we can record the operator's behavior, we can build up a kind of process trace that talks about the interactions between these. And this becomes the process tracing. <coughs> the process tracing is not just what's happening in the operator's head. It's what's happening in the world and what's happening in uh, the operator is doing in the world that allows us then to make inferences. I should make this in a different color. We can make inferences from these observations in the process tracing about what has to be happening in the head. That is, we are not limited to using just verbal data and people's reports of their world, but we can actually look at the world ourselves and see what the world is doing and see what people are doing in the world and understand the interactions between them as being purposeful and goal-driven, and, and then we can make some inferences about what it is that people are actually doing in terms of the cognitive processes. If we're a little clever, Woods points out, we can find situations that have, that, 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 that constitute in, in the world sense a problem. He doesn't use the word quite so clearly, but, but you, could, you can imagine that the world, that there are sequences that can occur in the world that indicate a problem, okay? That you're going from, that something has happened and that you need, it needs some attention, it could get worse in the future and so on. If you can identify this kind of sequence in the world, then you can look back and you can say, well, the kinds of sequences that people are engaging in in response to this demonstrate that they are, for instance, anticipating the future. And this is a basic control issue. You know that we control in anticipation of what's happening rather than just reactively, right? We look into the future and we see which things, where things are directed, where they are headed, and we control about thinking about the future rather than just about the current state. And that's one of the things of a good controller. So there's ways to get in to take a look at this. And so what Woods wants us to build is this this thing that, that he calls this process trace, which is not a process, which is not, it gets confused with all the other, we use process in so many different ways. The process trace is in fact this model of what's been happening in the world and what kinds of problems it's presenting and how people are solving that problem. And essentially becomes almost a kind of a, a dialogue between the world and the person. The world is saying this and the person is doing that. The world is saying this and the person is doing that. And we're tracing that dialogue going back and forth. And since we live in a world where there are lots of externalizations, anesthesia, for example, you know, what do we do? We give drugs, we adjust drips, we turn knobs, we do other things. There's lots of activities that we're doing. So it's possible to say, oh, well, you know, he used this drug at this particular point in time. That must mean that drug is used to raise blood pressure. That must mean that he believes that the blood pressure is now too low or going to be low. And therefore, how does that relate to what's going on in the world? We can, we can at least get that far. It's an indirect process. It's an indirect. We're not looking into the mind. We are, we, are, we are making indirect inferences about some of the things that must be happening here. Not all of them, by any means, but just some of them. And we hope that over time we can get enough stuff in here and see enough different problems that we can begin to get a handle on what actually the cognition, what is required of people in terms of their cognition. That is, you can see this as being a setting in which this side is sort of the demand side and this is the supply side. That people are, the world is demanding things and that the human being is supplying them back and that there's a relationship, a kind of dialectic going on here between the two. That's all he's saying. It's actually very simple. Now one of the things that Woods is good at though is he recognizes that if you have a situation 
where there's a lot of stuff going on in the world and nothing seems to be happening in terms of externalizations. That is, you have somebody watching the screen. It's really hard to know what's going on during that time. I mean, this is really a difficult thing. And one of the things that you see is that when things get hot, people spend a lot of time watching screens. They spend a lot of time paying attention to what the problem is. And, and because they're not doing anything at that moment, it's hard to say what the, what's going on there. That is, this inference process breaks down if people don't externalize. And so what Woods is saying is, are there things that we can do out here someplace in the world that can be forcing functions to get people to externalize? What can you do in the world that will make people externalize? Preferably things that aren't too disturbing. And there are some things that you can do. You can add some particular kinds of tasks. Well, I'll, I'll make a task in here. And this one, this one is a very good one. He points this out to you, and, and it's a really powerful one, which is communication with another person. So if one of the things that people have to do is communicate with another person, you get some externalizations in terms of verbalizing what's going on. Now, it may not be verbalizing in the sense of deep explanation. It may be saying things like, put your finger on that bleeding vessel while I do something. You know, it's, a, it's an instruction or a command or a very specific kind of thing. But communication turns out to be an extremely good way of doing this, in part in healthcare because we do it all the time. Communicating, and I, would, I will say forced in the sense that it's, we are adding it to the system in some way, forced communication is very good. And where do we do this? We do this in training all the time, right? You're working with somebody who's a new uh, uh, person and, and they're, you're trying to do a task and, and they, you will be saying to them, what I'm trying to accomplish here is I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to get at that, or I can't quite see this. And surgeons do this all the time. They'll say to the guy holding the retractors, they say, I need a little more lift there. Well, it means they're looking for something underneath where their retractor is. I mean, they don't say that just to say it. They say that because it's somehow related to that problem. And so things that involve a lot of mechanical psychomotor skills tend to be good in this respect, and things that where we talk about problems and where we explain things and we ask people for help or we have them do things for us, these are useful places. They, ex they create a set of externalizations. And, and, and particularly if it's not, the, the question is who is it? The question is who are we talking to with whom and why? So it, you can make this difficult or you can make it easy. You can take uh, you know, a lawyer and put them inside the operating room and force communication with that person. Well, that's going to be very difficult. Okay. Or you can take a junior anesthesiologist in training and you can put them in the room. That becomes suddenly a whole bunch easier. So if you get people who have common sets of skills, common experiences, common knowledge bases, then the communication can be very efficient. You can do it very quickly. Uh, and it's likely to be very meaningful at that particular point. So, so the whom that you put in here is usually another expert, another person who's already familiar with the domain, somebody who's doing this work, rather than a novice or a beginner. Novices or beginners are not what you, what you would add to this to make this work better. The other observation that Woods makes and, and that Namath makes particularly uh, is that the world is filled with naturally occurring stuff that works very well to serve this function. And there are two things that come up immediately. The first is technology. Many of the things that we want to accomplish are accomplished by interacting with some sort of technology. There, that technology is in the world. In order for us to make, have the effects that we want to have, we have to go and interact with the technology. And that can be as simple as turning up the, the, um, the thumb wheel on an IV drip. Okay. Or it can be as complex as programming an IV pump for a new value. So if I see, if I have technology that requires interaction in the world in order to function, those interactions become part of the externalizations that I can then use to make this up. And so even if people are not saying a lot of stuff, they can be interacting with technology in such a way 
that I can use that as a process for making some inferences back to what they were thinking. Okay? So the technology, we live in technology rich worlds and this is really a valuable tool. The fact that the technology is there gives us a chance to pursue this. What, what's the question? 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 <laughs> Say it out loud, we'll all get benefit from it. That's right. Yeah. We're, well, we're doing it, but we're doing it indirectly. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is we're saying that people in the world are interacting with these things, like the technology, and doing so forces a kind of externalization. That's an externalization that allows us to then say, I don't know, I, I, I don't know why, but he went over and he turned this switch. And this is the switch that controls the pump. So we can conclude that either he didn't know what the switch was for, and he was just turning switches because he likes to turn switches. That's the three-year-old idea. Or he thought that the pump was often needed to be on. Why would he think that the pump needs to be on? Well, the pump controls these sorts of things. He understands that. He, did, he, he understands that the pump is necessary to accomplish this and this. He's trying to get to these things, and we can begin to make those kinds of understanding. Yeah? And you can, you, can, you can ask him why, when you, but when you ask him why, you get back into this problem, right? Which is that you're likely to get a rationalization. That is, when you say, why did you do this? People will say, I did this because there is this relationship between pumps and blah, blah, blah. That may not be the process that they actually use. So again, when you do interviewing, it's quite difficult. It gets into this. But, but if you are just simply watching people working in the world at the time, it's the way they make the world work. The same thing is true of artifacts, particularly the cognitive artifacts, like uh, information sources, uh, like displays and other things like that. And this is one of the, we get some benefit from this because it turns out that, that if, we, if we think about our original job, which was to come up with some sort of really good display, one of the things that we would say that made this display so good is there was no operation required, right? It, the fact is, um, it, nobody had to do anything that the screen showed you everything all the time that you wanted to see. It was perfect. You didn't have to touch it. Whereas this one, there was a window here that contained some information, and there's a window here that contains some information, there's a window here that contains some information. And one of the tasks that the operator has to do is to switch between windows to be able to get the information. I have to go to the laboratory page to see what the blood count is, and then I have to go over to the medicine page to see what medicines he's taking, and so forth. And so this is not as good as this, right? This is a, this is a defective display from our perspective. We don't like this one. This is not good because it imposes work on him. But interestingly enough, from, a, from an experimental point, point of view, this is actually quite good. Because it imposes this work, when he's using that display, he has to actually do things to the display, to, and those things can allow us to make inferences about what information he was using. We can say, gee, he looked at the medicines page. Why did he look at the page listing the patient's medicines? He wanted to know what medicines the patient was on. If you get the perfect display, no operation required, he just looks at the display, you have no externalization you can't see. And you go, oh, I don't know, he looked at the display. He got what he needed. So one of the, one of the paradoxes is that, that clumsy artifacts may be better for our research purposes than really good ones. That is, we talk about how bad our computer systems are and all the rest of that stuff. In some ways, that may actually be advantageous to us as researchers because they force more externalizations which allow us to do these kinds of inferences about what people are thinking. It's a, it's a, funny, kind of, uh, it's a funny kind of idea, but it actually works in that way. It, it turns out that sometimes the, 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 pro, the things that create stumbling blocks and obstacles actually are useful because people will, will do that. Now, let's be clear. They may also simply decide that it's too much effort to do that and skip that whole phase. It's not the case that they will always do it. But you understand that the idea is here that, that some of this stuff can actually be information that we can use. 
if we, one of the things that's nice about this is that the worlds that we look at are, in this respect over here, rich worlds. They are rich in the sense that there are lots of information sources, lots of artifacts, lots of things for people to interact with. That we, we study these worlds in part because they are so rich in all this stuff that it allows us to make these inferences easier. If you take, by comparison, somebody doing a purely um, visual task, like diagnosing an x-ray, there's not a lot of externalization there. There's not a lot of stuff that you can use to make these inferences. So one of the reasons that artifacts work for us in this world is because they are sources of, of externalizations. And, they, in, and, and particularly the artifacts that people make require some effort to do it. And because they require some effort, they're only done when that information is necessary. The other thing that we have to have in order to make this work is we want, it to be, we want our world to be pressurized and consequential. Look, you can say all this about a, a word processing task. You could study word processors, and you could say, are they, we can look at the externalizations, all that rest of that stuff. Yeah, you could, do, you could do that. You could study word processing software using this technique. Is it very useful? It's not very useful. There are many different ways to do word processing, and they plus and minus and this and that. It doesn't really matter, OK? On the other hand, if you're not talking about word processing, but you're talking about launching a manned spacecraft, the consequences matter. And when the consequences matter, you tend to strip away everything that is unimportant. When you are doing surgery, when you are taking care of the critically ill dying patient in the ICU, when you are piloting the U-2 aircraft, all of those things are so important that all other tasks basically get shed in favor of this. And pressurized in the sense that there's lots of this stuff, information flowing rapidly and continuously, so that you do not have a lot of spare time. In a pure psychological way, the way you would measure this, if you wanted to study this, is by a thing called a secondary task, where you have people working on a primary task, and then you give them a secondary task with instructions that they're only to do that when they have the time, when they, don't, when they, when they are not busy. Like in, in uh, anesthesia, this has been done by putting a light on the uh, equipment stack behind uh, where, the, where the anesthesia machine is, putting a light on it with a button. And when the light goes on, you push the button and the light will go off. That's all it does. It doesn't do anything else. Okay? And, and what you can do is you can measure how long it takes between the time the light goes on and the time someone pushes, the guy pushes the button. And you can say, as that time gets longer, he's, his workload is higher. Right? If he has no workload, if the workload is zero, he's going to sit and look at that light. And every time it goes on, he's going to push the button. So the response time is going to be very low. On the other hand, if, if he is busy doing things, it's a secondary task, and you can shed that and throw that away so the light can go on. And if you plot this over time, you can plot sort of the inverse workload. This is the, lo the longer this, or, or the direct workload, the longer it takes to, to get to the light, the higher the workload is. We want places where there's no time for the secondary task at all, where the secondary task is not even feasible because the work is so intense that the only thing that people are doing is paying attention to this important task. If we can find those places, then all of the externalizations that are made are going to be relevant to the task. They're not relevant to some other kind of activity. So we like places where the pace and tempo of work where the tempo of work overwhelms people's ability to do other things. Operating rooms, emergency rooms, intensive care units, cockpits. Uh, cockpits have become actually less this way over time. Air traffic control, a variety of, of process control industries, battlefield situations with military people. But, but the point is that 
you want to you choose the world that you are going to look at based upon these kinds of considerations. And, and that is because the way the world behaves will then force lots of externalizations that you can then use to, to work backwards and figure out what the cognitive processing was. I'm not saying that you cannot study places that do not have these things. I'm saying it's much more difficult to do that. And this is why all of the research that has been done in these areas that you read classical stuff is from places like operating rooms and cockpits and air traffic control and nuclear power plants because those are places where the consequences are so high and the tempo is in some cases so high that you can make that that, that you can make the 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 claim that the only thing that the operators are working on is managing the plant if they're discussing what they're going to have for FICA, it isn't high tempo. Now, the world turns out to pre present us a whole bunch of naturally occurring experiments that make it easy to study in this. It turns out that, that if you find places with these characteristics, they are also places that generate lots of problems. There are plenty of problems that appear that people are always active in trying to do the control. And so you have a rich world. And, and you can think of this as a world which, in which you are ex observing naturally occurring experiments. They're not controlled experiments in the sense that you can't go back and replay that one directly. But, but you can say, gee, dealing with a problem is a kind of experiment which, if I could trace it through, allows me to see what's going on here. So the natural occurrence of uh, bad weather in flying planes, uh, bad weather in northern Europe has an impact on air traffic control. It's a kind of, uh, when a storm system moves through, it's a kind of naturally occurring experiment that generates a collection of data that you can use. It's very much the same thing as if you were uh, an astronomer uh, and you're, you're looking at uh, you know, a supernova that has occurred out there. You don't control the supernova. You can't possibly create a supernova. That's a process that you don't have any control over. But you don't bother with it. You're not concerned about the fact that you can't control the supernova. That's not the issue. The issue is that it's a naturally occurring experiment that allows you to make certain claims about the way the world works. And so we spend huge amounts of money building elaborate observatories, which are, are there to detect phenomena that we don't control, naturally occurring experiments. And these are a series of naturally occurring experiments. The other thing that's very useful is if you get a, a rich enough trace, if you can produce a rich enough trace with lots and lots of data from the world, it is possible to do what Wood says and to use this as the basis for a simulation. That is, now you have a process trace. And you can use that as in the simulator to generate a kind of problem which you can give to successive people and ask them to solve it. And in fact, if this is really rich in terms of all the stuff, you can give people this, essentially the same problem. Now, it is true that you can give people the same problem and then all of a sudden, very quickly, their behaviors start to diverge. Right? Because not everybody will solve the problem in the same way. So the data that you've recorded in this trace will not always mimic things exactly. So there are lots of departures that you can get from this trace as you try to simulate it in the simulator. But what Woods is saying in his paper is, hey, that's actually quite interesting. Because what we would really like to do is go back and at various points in this is play this back to people. We want to play this back to our operators without them knowing what's going on out here. So we're going to have an operator who's going to watch this thing unfold. And then we're going to ask the operator to comment on the activities that people are doing. So the operator has this model in his head of what the trace is, but only out to this certain point that we've shown them. The operator becomes what Woods would call a neutral observer. 
This technique involves having somebody with the same level of competence and skills, the same kind of profession, the same kind of expertise, but having them watch the events and see what's happening in this trace. And then asking the question, uh, is this rather than what would you do, asking the question, is this a reasonable thing to do? The operator is doing something. Is this is this externalization that this operator did, is that externalization a reasonable thing to do under these circumstances? Or can you explain to me why someone would do that under these circumstances? That is, we use the neutral observer, who's another operator who's got the same level of expertise, to make comments on or, or evaluate performances at different things. And if they can think of reasonable kinds of uh, ways in which this is happening, you can say, oh, I can see why he did that. I can see why he put in that central line at that stage. Why did the patient, why did we put a central line into that patient at that stage? Well, I can see that you might want to do that. This is a good point at which to put in the central line, you know, think you're quiet, you want to get that in, blah, blah, blah. If you can, if you can play this back a bit at a time to the next point of externalization and ask the question each time, is this a reasonable thing to do? you can actually sort of build a model of what it is that operators are doing over time. And you can also evaluate the qualities of the performance. As long as neutral operators, by the way, not knowing the outcome, one of the things that's key in the neutral operator thing to make it work and avoid hindsight bias is you don't want them to know that the, that the outcome was bad. You hide that from everybody, right? But you record the trace and you say, is this a reasonable thing to do? Is this a reasonable thing to do? And if, if at every turn it's a reasonable thing to do and you still, get, you still get the bad outcome out here, then clearly we're not talking about some problem with the operator. And indeed, this is what Woods is talking about doing when he talks about replaying these critical incidents or accident reports. He's trying to get us to go into this world. And one of the ways, one of the things that you can do is this can be something that you have done in looking at an example. But this could also be an accident trace, right? You, if you've got enough information, you can build that accident trace. And indeed, that's what they do. You do it in, pilot, in, in airplane simulators all the time. In the DC-10 crash outside Chicago, uh, it turned out that in the simulator, any pilot who, who was given the same information as the pilots of that DC-10 crashed the plane. And when pilots could find out that they had lost a, an engine and had lost control of that wing, they were able to get the plane back under control. The problem is you cannot see the wing and the engine from inside the cockpit of a DC-10. So the pilots didn't have that information. If you put people in the same position as the pilots, they behave in the same way and the plane crashes. But if you give them extra information, you say, oh, this is what's happened out here. This is what's going on. They have better ability to control the flight. This is not an indictment of the operators. It's a way of understanding what critical information needs to be present in order to be able to fly the plane. And you can think of us playing this out in a variety of ways here. Well, that's about enough for today. But you see that, that we admit that we can't have direct access to this. We don't, we don't disagree with that. And we do admit what Lisanne is talking about, that words are, in fact, and particularly words that we get out of interviews or questionnaires or things like that, these are rationalizations about what people have done in the past. They're not reports of memory traces of how they have behaved. But that doesn't necessarily prohibit us from doing things that allow us to make inferences about what people are actually doing cognitively. And so we have this opportunity to do this. And if you look at Chris's example in, in his, uh, uh, in his uh, thing, what he does is he finds a key artifact and he makes copies of the artifact and then has multiple people do a task with the artifact that's relevant to the thing and records those people's activities on video camera and then talks about the different strategies that people use for solving that particular problem. Does it tell you everything about what's going on? Absolutely not. We're only sampling this tiny, uh, uh, it's a small sample of a space that contains lots and lots of stuff. But the idea is that if we know something about how this works, 
we could actually decide how to do this. We might be able to skip the intermediate stages and get right down here very quickly because we've actually been able to discover the problems associated with this by knowing how people have to deal with these sorts of problems. Okay? That's what they're trying to say, in my view. Questions? <laughs>